Hello, everybody, and welcome to another top 10 edition of Magic Mics, proudly sponsored by our Patreon supporters and CoolStuffInc.com. You can find cool stuff in stock every day, and our co sponsor, CardHoarder.com, offering the best inventory prices and delivery of cards for Magic Online. I am Evan Irwin, and we get started each week by saying hello to my two co hosts, Aaron Campbell. Hi, everybody. Ruben Bressler. Hi. I was doing my. You're doing this guy your, behind me impression. Yeah, your puppet Muppet. <laughs> yeah, guy what's going on? How's there. it going? Everything is lovely. That wasn't weird at all. That was creepy. Yeah, a little. That's good. Happy Halloween. And happy March 237th or whatever it is right. these days. We also begin with our choice of the top comment from last week in a segment we call Honorable Mention, where Ruben will tell us who was the most eloquent and letting us know what card we did not choose as one of our top 10 kicker cards. Ruben? We had some excellent entries this week on a number of cards that are well beloved in the community, but I decided to go with Good Ship Zion, who mm-hmm. writes. Got a pesky non-creature permanent you need to destroy? Mold Shambler to the rescue. <laughs> and it's pauper legal. Yeah, it is. Oh, Mold, Mold Shambler is a terrific creature. This is a green and three generic mana for a common from Zendikar. It's a 3-3 three, three fungus beast. With kicker of a green and a generic mana, you may pay a green and a generic mana as you cast it. When Mold Shambler enters the battlefield, if it was kicked, you destroy target non-creature permanent. So this was kind of like a disenchant on top of kind of a, sort of a hill giant type of creature. We right. were excited about this card back in the day. These days, this had to be at least a 4-4 four, four or a four or five we're not getting out well, of bed yeah. like they're not i mean it's, like, it's a it's a hill giant but it is also common it was a great common way to deal with a planeswalker mm. uh especially in limited uh yeah i mean uh and, and it's seen ton of pauper play from tortured existence decks to various mid-range decks and things like that yeah the ability to get that extra value on top of a creature is uh not to be underestimated so we certainly appreciate that congratulations to good ship zion please contact aaron on social media before she blocks you on all of them <laughs> 33,000 and grow. 34, I think now. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I was adding a number right then. Thanks again. Always. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Thanks again to GoolStuffInc.com for sponsoring this giveaway. And stay tuned for our top 10 list this week. And maybe you can win next week's free gift certificate. Because we are talking about our top 10 John Avon cards. Our first time. We've done a lot of these. We've, in fact, this is the 136th top 10. I know that because I keep track. Yeah. And we get to talk about John Avon cards. Yeah, this is going to be a bit of an experiment for us. You know, we had talked about um, doing top 10 artist episodes because we've never really gone there before. We've done like top 10 art, you know, or top mm. 10 artists. But we've never we've never like picked an artist and then just chosen to go through their catalog. So hopefully you all like it. Um, if this turns out well, we'll probably do more of them and that will give us a lot to pull from in the future. Mm. Um, if it doesn't... Because if we're going to do 136 more of these, um, <laughs> we need topics. We need things to chatter about and put in yeah. orders. So that's that. Uh, that said, feel free to explain your list however you like. Uh, Ruben, what's your number 10? So I decided to, I have a bit of a mix between, I don't really have a tournament. Like, usually when I build my list, I'm like, oh, did this win a Pro Tour? Is this in the cube? Was this on the MTG bracket? Has it seen a bunch of play? I didn't really do any of that this time. Mm -hmm. When I looked through the list, I was like, oh, that is an indelible image in my head from the history of magic, Mm -hmm. right? That this is a card that I recognize maybe for its tournament pedigree, but mostly for its art and its impact on me. And all of the cards on my list, including my number 10, are no different. Very early in my development as a Magic player, I very quickly became uh, attached to the idea of combo decks. Um, I wasn't always a aggro mage. I, I started out as a, a combo kind of player. And mostly that combo was like uh, critical mass kind of combos, like tinker decks, um, you know, trying to put stuff together. Uh, and one of the archetypes that I very quickly came upon was the replenish style decks that put a bunch of stuff in your graveyard and then brought a million things back. And the way that you killed people in that deck was a John Avon card called Opalescence. Yeah. Opalescence is two colorless white, white for an enchantment. Each other non aura enchantment, it has been errated from global enchantment, is a creature in addition to its other types that has base power and base toughness, each equal to its converted mana cost. So basically, what you would do is you would play something like an attunement, uh, discard a bunch of your, you know, parallax tides and parallax waves and whatever, what have you, you know, loot through a bunch of your deck with frantic search, and then you'd play a replenish, get an opalescence on the field. And then attack for a gazillion. 
Yeah, this card is also a part of the reserved list, so sure. not going to see any more reprints. It's only yeah. 16 bucks or so right now. This was like the original Starfield of Nyx. Yes. <laughs> this is one of the That's OG right. like ways of killing people in like Vintage and Legacy and whatnot, mm-hmm, was to run those mm-hmm. replenished decks that, you know, you could run in replenish like five mana. Am I right on that? Or is it four? Replenish is four mana. Oh my four. god, that card's so busted. So yeah, yeah. that's why that's why those cards are busted. Is it because these Someone interactions? tried playing that in Vintage a little while ago. They tried uh, taking like Standstill um, and Shark Typhoon and then, you know, Opalescence and Replenish and like you know, huh, doing love that whole that. thing. And I don't think it really got off the ground, but I was definitely keeping my eyes peeled for that one. I'm just watching and going, is this viable? Because I'll play it in an instance. <laughs> I, love, I love Shark Typhoon and Vintage. That yeah. is hilarious to me. This is one of those cards I really hate being on the reserve list because I think it would be cool to reprint this card or to kind of work this into maybe a commander deck or something. But, you know, now it's just tough to get a hold of. Mm-hmm. Which is unfortunate. Aaron, what's number 10? My number 10 is a card. One of the nice things about doing these lists is sometimes you discover a card for the first time that's so crazy and so weird that you just have to find room for it on your list. And my number 10 falls neatly into that category. Uh, My number 10 is Hum of the Radix. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Two colorless and two green, originally printed in Mirrodin. It's an enchantment. Each artifact spell costs one colorless more to play for each artifact its controller controls. What? (laughs) I've never seen this card before before um you know i don't i don't think i ever saw any play um you have this really it's all beautiful a little bit of play it's all just this a was, hair a yeah hair. this really was beautiful. this was in the when when affinity was at its peak yes this uh is... you played this alongside the four six worm that Arch made you sacrifice oh. um, some artifacts and stuff oh. it was just green stompy bad cards but okay. literally built to beat affinity yeah, yes. Fascinating. yeah. And so really beautiful card you know really revol- there's a lot of green and yellows happening you see some of those plants or ooze like things but you know really beautiful art but just one of those cards that i had to stop you know when i was scrolling i was like is this real it, it's yeah. a hum like what <laughs> yeah weird name it, it's a really cool card that actually fit you know at one point in time affinity was ridiculous like we were desperate to find anything that would stop it and a four yeah. mana enchantment that does nothing when it enters the battlefield was not the answer because by the time turn four came around if you were on the draw god help you uh they would have already had infinite permanence on the board drawn extra mm-hmm. cards gotten all sorts of craziness going on with ravager uh which didn't even come until dark steel remember there was already a problem sort of there was already a cool oh, yeah. affinity deck and then it got stupidly worse so uh yeah this is one of those you know eh, kind of examples that you can come through history and say hey here was some hate it wasn't good enough if this was two mana maybe 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 it would have done something but not at four not at four so for my top 10 list for me i just sort of went on pure visuals i think uh the artist series to me is like what art stands out to me what art i want to sort of talk about and and highlight um and my number 10 was you know uh, for me as a lot of these lists you know we just kind of go through the cards i was looking through the whole list and i was kind of going going back over them and some of them i would you know i kind of zoom in and try to see their art a little bit closer and and one of those that really stuck out to me that has a lot of sort of I don't know, sort of, um, uh, it's uh, the je ne sais quoi, right? Like kind of like, wow, this really feels like the colors it's trying to represent. Mm -hmm. Uh When you look at a piece of artwork and this, I mean, as I understand it, let me, let me look back this goes, yeah, this goes all the way back to Guild Pact. Like when Ravnica was coming out and we were flipping out at how cool these things were. And you're like, wow, the red, blue are the, is it mages? Right. And like, where do they, where do they work? How do they work in there? And they, well, they have, is it boiler works? And the, is it yep. boiler works are where they make that magic happen. That's how they kind of make the whole system of waters and stuff work. And I love it. Is it boiler works is a common originally from Guild Pact. We've been reprinted a million times. Um, it's a land enters the battlefield when it enters the battlefield return a land you control to its owner's hand and it taps to add a red and a blue to your mana pool uh these lands of course were absolutely amazing so good they just kind of took them out of sets and they won't give them back yep. anymore because they were great um <laughs> yeah. but yeah the, the image itself i just love yeah yeah because essentially this is two land drops in yeah. one card mm-hmm. yeah it's really beautiful lots of bronzes lots of tans it almost kind of has that vaseline filter on it like you see where it yeah. looks very very you know, steamy foggy steamy yeah, yeah but very subtle still like it doesn't like beat you over the head with steam it's just kind right. of right. yeah this is a lot of the time when you have lands in particular you have sort of just oh we'll take some black and we'll take some green and we'll put them in the art together Mm -hmm. if you look at is it boilerworks there isn't really any blue there isn't really any red it but it all kind of mixes and melds together in Mm -hmm. a in a really interesting way this also has art i feel like i can hear 
Like, yeah. you know, sometimes you look at an image and like, you can hear the hissing and you can hear the the clanging. Like, I, I feel like I'm there. Just well, the chugging and the steam release yeah, and all this exactly. other stuff <laughs> happening in the background. <laughs> yeah, absolutely fantastic piece. Uh, let's move on here to number nine. Mine is higher on somebody else's list, but that's okay. Ruben, what's your number nine? My number nine is uh, a centerpiece of a major story uh, in the magic uh, storyline. Um, you know, the, the Riptide Project oh. was a conglomeration of blue wizards that came together uh, on Oteria to try to bring back, spoiler alert, the Slivers. Mm-hmm. And they, spoiler alert, succeeded. And one of the main places that they did this was at the Riptide Laboratory. Mm. Riptide Laboratory is a rare land from Onslaught. It's also on the list, Mm. but it was in Jumpstart, which I didn't realize. Mm. Uh, Tap out a colorless and pay a colorless or play a generic and a blue and tap colon return target wizard you control to its owner's hand. This has seen some amount of competitive play as well, uh, mostly in fairies, a little bit in blue white stone blade. Um, anything that has something like, oh, for example, a Snapcaster Mage or a Vendillion Click that you sort of want to uh, reuse again and again, this is a great way to do it. Didn't you incorporate that into a Broken Pack storyline, too? I so uh, This was your one-shot thing, right? This was my one-shot. This was the okay, board that I Weatherlight... I still recall us being in Vegas and you telling yes, us about yes. this over dinner. Okay. Oh, and yes. it was great. And... This was the one-shot <laughs> the, the one shot of where I brought the slivers to Dominaria. Okay. This was before the Broken Pack. Oh, wow. Um, was at the Riptide Laboratory, yeah. Nice. Yeah, the uh, it's also interesting to see like the onslaught printing versus the jumpstart printing. You can see how much they oh, yeah. lightened up the bottom of the painting. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can really see that like it's it's actually yeah. sort of glass all the way around there. And uh, yep. I thought that was really nice. Okay, yeah, the whole thing is brightened up. But yeah, you're right. It's more noticeable down there. Yeah, big time. Aaron, what's number nine? So it's no secret I love budget EDH, and my number nine is one of my boyfriend's favorite cards. He needs no excuse to use this. It's one of his favorite forms of removal. Uh, my number nine is Brittle Effigy. Um, so Brittle Effigy is a one colorless. It was originally printed in Magic 2011. It's an artifact, and it's very simple. Four colorless and a tap. You exile Brittle Effigy, and you exile target creature. So you, know, you play it in the early game, and you just sort of leave it out there. Like, okay, I'm putting you on notice. Like, if you have one creature and you get a little crazy, I'm going to get rid of it or you can play it in the late game and just immediately do it just be like here's one (laughs) look at the battlefield here's four (laughs) um and it's an exile effect this is a rare and it goes for like 25 cents and he just loves cracking this and i always just i always just i hate looking at the battlefield like damn he's a brittle effigy (laughs) yeah this is a good example of being really aware of where the colon is in this card yes if it was four generic tap colon exile <clears throat> brittle levity yeah. and target creature you could do some loops and you could bounce it with the, yeah. with the trigger on the stack right. but yeah. part of the payment is getting rid of it really beautiful yeah. art um you know I, I feel like i've seen statues like this before that are on like an illuminated base i think it might be like christmas time you sometimes see things like this and mm-hmm. so either that or it reminds me of, dare i say mrs butterworths like <laughs> <laughs> well, I think trying to get that kind of the, that, that glass shimmer is yeah. incredibly difficult. Like, yes. He, he makes it look really easy, I think, mm-hmm. in this piece. Because, like, all yeah, those absolutely. shadows and light rays and stuff and the wisps going around, all super mm-hmm. cool. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. You're moving here to number eight. Ruben, what's your number eight? My number eight, I think, is a first in the history of top tens. I think. I think that this is the first plane card planner card this is the first okay. plane chase plane that we've had on any list um Sounds I, right. I, I i could be mistaken but these don't see competitive play and they don't you know and it's also a big story piece uh, especially in the world of mirrodin because uh the seat of memnarch's power where he controlled his artifact minions is a place called the panopticon and that is my number eight panopticon is a plane on the plane of Mirrodin from Plane Chase, and it was also in Plane Chase anthologies. When you planeswalk to the Panopticon, draw a card. At the beginning of your draw step, draw an additional card. And when you roll the planar symbol on the planar da- die, draw a card. Uh, a Panopticon in the real world is, 
you've seen them. So, like, in the first Guardians of the Galaxy, the prison is a panopticon. Okay. Where you have, like, a guard tower in the middle with the guard, with the uh, the prisoners on the outside. So that the guard tower can see all of the jail cells at the same time. Hmm. And the jail cells can't ever really tell if they're being watched. You know what this um, actually reminded me of, which is a little bit far off, is um, if you've ever seen Deep Space Nine, the box they keep the orbs yep. in, that's yep. what this kind of looks like. Just whoop. Very similar. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, this card is really cool. And Plane Chase was this weird idea that Wizards like sort of championed and then they and they kind of championed it again. And then mm-hmm. did they I don't did they do three or two? I can't remember exactly. They may have done three. I think they might I have think done that three. they did two plus an anthology, maybe. That sounds about right. And it was like one of those things where clearly somebody really loved it inside the building, but yep. like yep. We just don't. It's really a cool idea, really but it adds it, really. it adds so much randomness. I've played a mm. lot of uh, plane chase with with friends, and gee boy howdy, if you think Commander is a crapshoot to begin with, just wait until you roll like the the Horizon bows or you know some ridiculous plane. Hmm. It's crazy. Fair enough, Aaron. What's number eight? My number eight is one of two hires on my list. Oh. Fair enough, fair enough. Well, uh, my number eight actually kind of surprised me in terms of like, this was, you know, we're going through every piece of his art and magic and I'm just kind of scrolling. I'm like, wow, that's a really cool piece. And like, and so I'm scrolling back and then I'm going to other pages and I keep thinking about this piece. I'm like, man, I know it's not the most amazing card. It's not a card that you're probably even going to see that often anyway, but man, the art is so incredible. And the way that it conveys the sort of the strength of a storm, the way that it has this, this, this thing made out of wood and it's kind of like creaking. You can almost, you can almost hear type things. And this hangman's noose howling. A, uh, yeah. hanging down right here on the gallows at willow hill yeah uh, the gallows at willow hill is a three generic mana rare artifact from abyssin restored it says three generic mana tap uh and tap three untapped humans you control colon destroy target creature its controller puts a one one white spirit creature token with flying onto the battlefield so flavorful yeah it just, what a yeah. cool it's such a cool piece of art. It's such a cool flavor card. Right. I wish it were playable in any capacity. Um, it's it, just it, great, though. I love the it's art. It's really creepy and yeah. and like adult themed for a you know we sort of hand wave you know things go to the graveyard right right so this is sending things <laughs> to their death in a way that we don't see brutal. Uh, on magic cards and it's beautiful as well and look at what he did with the light it's like blue right there in the middle and it's all surrounded by the darkness like oh it's 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 so much i couldn't handle it It was going through this work it was amazing all right let's move to number seven mine is my last hire so that'll be fun ruben what's your number seven my number seven is a card of a cycle that is indelible in magic history and it's a cycle that magic knew needed to have the the touch it needed to have the powerhouses and so this cycle of five cards was only entrusted to john avon and rob alexander two of the land masters in magic history true. uh john avon was given two of them uh perhaps the most popular one but also the one that i think i think and I've said many times on the show, could possibly be unbanned and modern. It's time to free the tree. One number seven's Tree of Tales. Mm. Oh. Tree of Tales is an artifact land, a common from Mirrodin, and it taps for a green mana. And that is what it does. Um, but to turn a forest into an artifact and make it feel like both a forest and an artifact at the same time takes a specific kind of talent that John Avon has. And I really like this a lot. Without going too far in either direction, you know, it'd be really easy to make it like too mechanical or right. to yep. make it too, it really just rides the line. You know, you're looking at this and like, it almost has like barbed wire around it. And so it's just the perfect mix, you know, and then you have yep. the, you know, very creepy looking forest behind it. You have, you know, what appears to be a sun behind it, the hues there. It's, it's it, the way it matches so perfectly with like the text box, like, like that green is just, it's green, green, green. The coordination is there. Same hue of green. I really like it. Yeah. The color correction essentially they did on this was, was really nice to make sure that those hues matched mm-hmm. and have it be both sort of organic yet clearly mechanical is yeah it was a hat trick very nice yeah. aaron what's your number seven 
My number seven is a card that I have fond memories of because when I first started playing Modern Ad Nauseum, this was a card that we ran one copy of in the sideboard um, to mostly deal with Leyland of Sanctity because people would bring in Leyland of Sanctity so that you can't target them with your Lightning Storm. Um, and then this was a way to really get around that, laugh at them, and hopefully kill them. Uh, my number seven is Patrician Scorn. Mm -hmm. um, so Patrician Scorn is three colorless and a white. It's an instant from Future Sight. It's only been printed once. It says if you've played another white spell this turn, you may play Patrician scorn without paying its mana cost and it just says destroy all enchantments so um, if you're playing modern ad nauseum you're probably playing either angel's grace or phyrexian unlife which is your white spell and then you go ahead and you draw your whole deck and your opponent just sits there really confident you know looking at their leyland of sanctity or looking at their you know stony silence or what have you and then you're just like whoop <laughs> yep. and just for free just did it, it all goes away and so uh, mm -hmm. we don't really run this card anymore but for a while there this was great and i always loved just that that confidence of like Oh, I'll get you in a minute. <laughs> Yeah. I'll I'll take kind of a little oddball sort of uh, abilities yeah. here that you get for free as long as you've played another you know copy mm -hmm. of the same or the color of the same cost or whatever. Card's great. Yeah. I've I've definitely done some weird stuff with patricians because you're drawing mm -hmm. your whole deck anyway, yeah. right? So if you're if you have you would be like, oh, I have a Phyrexian Unlife in play. I can't cast my Patri <laughs> wait a second. I have my whole deck in my hand. I'll just yeah. like play four Simeon Spirit Guides and Manamorphose and who mm -hmm. cares. Right. Um, but yeah, I've definitely done this a couple of times. It's really fun to be like, here's a four, four for, four, uh, for, you know, for five and destroy all your, uh, your, your two fertile grounds or whatever. Um, <laughs> it's, it's really backbreaking against the right kind of deck. Very yeah. nice. All right. Let's move on here to number six. All right. Uh, my number six here is a, uh, is one of those cards that, you know, as you were going through his, his work, I was like, wow, that is so, striking was the word the word was just like this card just like pulls you in this is a very unique card not a lot of cards look anything close to this and the ability for this to have you focused so closely on the center of the image is truly awesome the way that he made insidious dreams look yeah. unique it's a black and three generic mana fate, or rare from Torment, only printed once, up to 11 bucks. It is an instant that says, as an additional cost to play it, discard X cards from your hand. You search your library for X cards and shuffle your library and put those cards on top of it in any order. That's what it does. I played this card in Old Extended with <laughs> Draco Erratic Explosion. Oh my god. To kill people. Yeah. That was fun. You can do uh, it. That was, what deck was that? That was like a, I was playing like a four color tooth and nail deck oh my god. that had collective restraint in it. Wow. And if I couldn't win with tooth and nail, I would just 16 them with a Draco. Hmm. Uh, I mean, yeah, sure. I played some wild stuff back in the day. Insidious Dreams is amazing. I love I that card. I love this. I love the, you know, the books in the air that appear to be flying towards this person who might be chainer based on the flavor text and mm -hmm. the way the light almost looks holy you know you have it just being surrounded by darkness but then there's this most holy light in the middle and so i love the contrast between the darkness and the light and the knowledge and the books and you know you can the, the way that they appear to have you know being the way they're, they're taking flight but then if you look you really don't see a floor there like it just appears to be like there's just so much going on here and it's just so beautiful yeah, yeah. there was a whole series of like turbulent dreams and then there's nostalgic oh. dreams oh yeah okay. yeah there was a whole devastating dreams devastating was the dreams. one that saw the most play okay. i think yeah because each player sacrifices x lands and it deals mm -hmm. x damage to each creature um yep. after you discard your hand or whatever discard x cards so yeah there was a whole cycle and they were totally sweet and i just love them so Ruben. Yeah, what? Insidious Dreams also saw a lot of play in the old uh, Enduring Ideal decks as well. Hmm. Um, not sense. the versions that ended up winning uh, or making second place in Pro Tour Valencia, but it was a great way to uh, you know clear out your hand to go to be able to shuffle it back in or to go find your Enduring Ideals. Right. All right, uh, Ruben, what's number six? My number six is. A card that features a, a facet of John Avon's style that we don't see as much or appreciate as much, but I feel like the feeling that you get in the close-up of this person's face is unique. We don't see faces and hands and really uh, detailed skin from John Avon a lot, like you would from some other artists. But the art for Annex <laughs> really showcases... Not only his ability to put a landscape into a snow globe, which of course we know John Avon can do, but also this really menacing, like, um, 
scowling. God. The hand like, is scowling. Too. That's a good yeah, hand. Yeah, uh, like uh, confident. This guy's got BDE for sure. Uh, <laughs> like he just knows what he's doing. Wow. Annex, two colorless blue blue. Enchant land, originally an uncommon from Onslaught. Reprinted in ninth, so it's modern legal. <laughs> Why? You control enchanted land. This is dumb. This card is dumb. First of all, on a mechanical level, this card is not fair. It's no. Stone Rain for one more mana in blue. It had the Magnivore deck had this thing in it. It was dumb. Like, Annex today would be a top yeah. tier card because we oh, know how sure. important lands are. <laughs> well, it's they don't Non-Huli want Acid Moss is what it is. Oh, yeah. It's Reaping So. Yeah. yeah, it's crazy. You get the land, they lose the land. So now that the, I mean, it's crazy. This is also it's my number sword. seven. So I was... Right there with you. I love Annex. I've yep. always loved this art. The ability to get that kind of like, sort of like to show smugness is really yeah. difficult in my opinion in terms of artwork. And this yeah. is smug. Like yes. Just right there. All right. Aaron, what's your number six? My number six is a card that Modern Jund does not leave the house without. And I even played it too back when I played Black Green Decks. It's uh, a really unique form of removal that um, usually will only get you one or two things. But if you play your cards right, you can do a lot of damage with this card. Uh, my number six is Maelstrom Pulse. Mm. Sometimes he's legacy sideboard play as well. Yeah. Uh, Maelstrom Pulse is one colorless, a black and a green, originally printed in Alara Reborn. Um, it's a sorcery and it says destroy target non-land permanent and all other permanents with the same name as that permanent. So God help you if you're playing anything with four of or if you're playing a token deck um, because you can just name spirits and then all your spirits go away or you can name a planeswalker. Whatever you, whatever's bothering you, you can get rid of it with this card and right. if you play your cards right, you can get rid of multiple things too. Yeah, yeah no, this the original, is the... Go ahead. The, the original from Alar Reborn was by um... Uh, let me get his name here. Anthony Francisco. Yes. Uh, but the most recent printings uh, sort of went away from the sort of cloudy pulse with a much more EMP kind of yeah, grenade going on. The original is so off. vague. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so the ultimate box topper and uh, uh, for ultimate masters, masters, they got, got version. the new version. Yeah. 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 And they reprinted again in double masters. This is also a good example of like wizards. Please stop. It's only worth a dollar now. Would you stop? You <laughs> did it. When I was when I I mean back when I was playing black green, it was it was fifteen twenty dollar card. Oh, yeah. Like it was definitely a card you had to borrow because you didn't want to pay for another copy. Yeah. It was a really awesome, expensive, exciting card to open. These days, it's like all right, that's that that's your dollar rare. But, but it no. made John more affordable. Because because Jun used to be one of the most expensive decks in modern and might still be, but maybe because of yeah. Liliana and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But Maelstrom Pulse itself, the artwork here, that sort of that the electricity line that kind of yeah, goes yeah. around. Oh, that's so nice. I love it. All right, let's move in here to number five. Ruben, what's your number five? My number five is a card that does, of course, have a ton of uh, competitive pedigree uh, in uh, one style of deck, but across multiple formats. But to me, I chose it for this list. For a number of reasons. There's a, a very distinct foreground, middle ground, and background uh, that showcases the flavor of the world in a really interesting way. It also incorporates a story from a previous visit to that block in the middle ground. My number five is Thespian's Stage. <laughs> Thespian's Stage is, of course, uh, a land. Uh, and I need to bring it up. There it is. There we uh, go. It's originally from Gate Crash, um, and it has a tap, add a colorless, pay two generic, and tap. Thespian Stage becomes a copy of Target Land, except it has this ability. So typically, this is in concert with Dark Depths. Uh, you copy the Dark Depths. They are legendary. You keep the Thespian Stage. It has no counters. You sacrifice it. You make a 20-20. Uh, Robert's your father's brother. There you go. Um, and you, you can attack and win the game from that point. It's very difficult to yeah. deal with a 2020 flying indestructible creature. I feel like this was picked up almost immediately by by the death, yeah. um, by the, the Dark Depths decks. Legacy Lands, you know, loves oh, yeah. this card. Yeah. Practically um, made You for know, it. the Turbo Depths decks. Um, yeah, I mean, even Dredge for a while, there was a version of Vintage Dredge that would sideboard yep. into a Dark Depths deck and sure. you'd run a couple copies of this too. And I'm still trying to figure out, you know, I'm not the most fluent, you know, it is a bit of an art form. And so I'm still trying to get comfortable with like, okay, when do yeah. I crack it? In what order? Oh, I have nothing to do. I should just make a copy of your land. And like, yep. yeah, it's it still still sees a lot of play. The, uh, Black Green Turbo Depths was one of the best decks for a while. Then, of course, Thopter Depths. And I think Old they Extended. might be even using mm. it to copy uh, Field of the Dead now. Sure. More. Why not? <laughs> well, uh, do note it's the uh, flavor text here. Amid rumors of war, the third act of the absolution of the Guild Pact was quickly rewritten as a tragedy. 
Right, mm-hmm. because if you look at that art, you can see two actors dressed on the stage, which, by the way, the stage direction oh. or the art of the stage matches the backdrop of Ravnica in a beautiful way, yeah. and you can see the audience. But the two actors on the stage are dressed as Agris Koss and Zadek, the Lord of Secrets, yeah. and, and acting in the Absolution of the Guild Pact, which took place 80 years prior. And I think it's just it's just great. So cool. Aaron, what's number five? My number five is the last higher on my list. Oh, all right. Well, that's cool. That means I got to talk about this crazy card as soon as possible. Um, <clears throat> this is one of those cards that is such a striking image that... Artists oftentimes have uh, have struggled at times with sort of the scale of things, right? How do you how do you make something look so epic, right? How do you make something be kind of larger than it is, or or, or it kind of push this emotion onto you? And the emotion on this card that I feel like they were like, you know, John, you have to feel like you are the most isolated person on the planet. What if you were just all by yourself and there was nothing anywhere close? You were on the top of this giant tower, you know, almost Lord of the Rings-esque in many ways. And he said, I think he was like, yep, got you. And here is a sketch of what eventually became Curse of the Cabal. Curse mm-hmm. of the Cabal is from Time Spiral. It is a rare, it is a black and nine generic mana. So for 10 mana, it's a sorcery that says target player sacrifices half the permanents they control rounded down. It has suspend of two black and two generic mana. So rather than cast this card from your hand, you may pay two black and two generic mana and exile it with two time counters oh, on it. Oh, yeah, this card. Yeah, so it has suspend two of two black and two generic mana. So at the beginning of your upkeep, you remove a time counter. When the last one's removed, you cast it without paying its mana cost. Whew. And at the beginning of each player's upkeep... If Curse the Cabal is suspended, that player may sacrifice a permanent, and if that player does, you put two time counters oh, on wow. Curse so of the keep, Cabal. Keep it from going they off. They can keep it from going off, but it's kind of eating their stuff. It's always out there waiting, yeah. and this it's image like is just stack. incredible. Nice. Yeah, the image is amazing. I, just, I love it so I can't much. handle how cool this image looks. It's just amazing. It looks like the phone booth from Bill and Ted's coming through the uh, mm-hmm. the, the portal there. I'm yeah, Curse thinking... of the Cabal is such a terror in multiplayer games, mm-hmm. because you never know when you're going to have to sacrifice a permit especially in odd numbers if you have five players and there's a curse of cabal gets suspended it's just like really this is what's happening now yeah. because it suspends for two right so it only yeah. takes two upkeeps two in opponents. order for you to fire off so now they have to sacrifice something to keep it going <laughs> so there you go all right let's move on here to number four aaron what's number four my number four is pretty much a staple of Legacy Dredge at this point. Um, I think it also might be a fixture, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, of the Cephalid Breakfast Decks. <laughs> okay. uh, my number four is Cephalid Coliseum. <laughs> So Cephalid Coliseum is a land uh, you can tap to add just blue to your mana pool. Cephalid Coliseum deals one damage to you. Uh, it was originally printed in Odyssey. It has Threshold, which is one of my favorite mechanics. Um, you can also pay a blue and tap it, and you can sacrifice Cephalid Coliseum. Target player draws three cards and then discards three cards from their hand. So this is what this is the second land that you want to be playing in Legacy Dredge. You, know, you want to get a dredger in your yard. You want to get a little bit of action in there, and then you want to go off a of Cephalid Coliseum, which is a really big can't be countered, um, you know, draw and discard effect for you. Um, you can also turn this around and use it on your Doomsday opponent. A lot of people are playing Doomsday in Legacy right mm, now. And so, sure. you know, they love to get really, really low. And then sometimes you're just like, whoop. <laughs> Um, you know, it's just a really, really fun card. You can even have crazy turn ones with this too. Um, I've had games where I just crack everything with an LED, play this in an LED, and then whoop. <laughs> um, and you can just have a really, really good time. And so uh, I love this card. I love how it's very spooky, like the way the blues are set up. You definitely get a feeling that you're underwater um, in this grotto almost or this really damp area. Um, and I just, this card makes me so happy. This card is almost ten dollars as an uncommon yeah. and as a forty serious? forty dollar foil. <clears throat> oh yeah, me. Yeah. Is this in Cephalid Breakfast? I think so. It can be. Um, it's not a. It's it's a, it's usually just a way to dig into your combo piece. Oh, okay. Like th- cards like Cephalid Coliseum. Actually, specifically Cephalid Coliseum, because there's nothing really like Cephalid Coliseum. Um, are have always seen play in combo decks, but Dredge. 18 is really where it shines <laughs> yeah, um it, you know re, or this also in reanimator i yeah, mean this I mean, card's been great coliseum was i played this deck or i played this card way back then even back then just to do oh, four sure. reanimator strategies just to get stuff yeah. out you're right mind. it looks like they don't play it oh that's so weird yeah, yeah. Well, i'm sorry cephalid cephalid breakfast is because you have cephalid illusionist oh and then you then you like 
put a put a Neko shade or whatever the the Neko wafer. No man's end core. <laughs> yeah, you put a you you or you put the Shuko. That's what the card. Yeah, yeah Shuko. Like equip, uh, equip it, equip it, equip it, equip it. Yeah, you just keep targeting it. Targeted over and over and over yep. again. <clears throat> yeah. The, so that entire cycle of uncommon threshold lands from Odyssey, uh, four of them were done by John Avon, who is just such a master of color, being able to take a card like Zephyr Coliseum that's. The entire art is blue, and yet it has such feeling and and emotion in it. Centaur Garden, Cabal Pit, uh, Barbarian Ring, the same way. Yeah. Uh, the fourth entrant was uh, David Martin did Nomad Stadium. Um, and all of them just sort of have this interesting feel where you don't necessarily need another color in the art. Mm-hmm. Very different from uh, Is It Boilerworks in that, in that way. Yeah, but I mean, all those threshold lands were super sweet. I mean, I played oh, with yeah. Barbarian Ring a lot. It's free. It's it it's awesome. it's free. It's free real estate. It's true. Ruben, what's number four? Once a, a flawless segue. My number four is a card that the art is just the greenest green that's ever greened, <laughs> and the card is green. It is a card that is that is emblematic of what green does. The name is green. It got a new art in some of the dual decks and a Magic Online promo, but then they went back to it for Jumpstart. It was even referenced in a recent secret lore drop. My number four is Explore. Mm. (laughs) Explore is a colorless and a green for a sorcery. You may play an additional land this turn. Draw a card. Recently referenced by Franz Volwinkel in the secret lair drop uh, Yargle for the Explargles. Uh, but the OG John Avon land and Explorer's Reward is a view of tomorrow's possibilities. You just see looking over the Verdant Valley off into the mists. Somehow it's so simple, right? Yeah. It just looks so it doesn't feel um, the best like ones make it look effortless, right? Like, exactly. Yeah. It, it makes it all the different shades of green and it's really yeah. lovely. Yeah, I mean the whole how it works, you know, from the bottom to the to the top, from the foreground to the background, the the character there, the light sort of sort of shimmering off his shoulder yeah. there, like all that stuff just works so nicely. Uh, from to give the bottom that to the top, secret layer drop, pop it to pop. That's right. Okay, well, um, speaking of free real estate, while we continue on with that segue, <clears throat> uh, this is without a doubt um, my favorite. Probably my is it my favorite? It look it's almost my favorite land that mm-hmm. he has done. I've, I've got a couple spells and we got we talk about more some lands, but this card in particular, when this card came out, I was like, oh my god, look look at this thing! And I was like, just, I had I got a foil so I could put it in my cube. This thing was absolutely gorgeous. I loved it. I loved playing with it. It was very powerful. It's seen infinite reprints for good reason. Uh, it's very similar to a previous pick because my pick is Azorius Chancery. Azorius mm-hmm. Chantry, much like Is It Boiler Works, is quintessential Azorius. It is regal. It is shiny. It is gorgeous. It is kind of overwhelming in its beauty, even. Uh, Azorius Chantry is a common from Dissension. It's a land that comes into play tapped. When it enters the battlefield, you return a land you control to its owner's hand, and you tap to add white and blue mana. That's what it does. Yeah, the the light, that's got to be difficult to do. Like, that yeah. just, the way that that light, you know, it, it looks almost holy, you know, mm-hmm. and how perfect everything is, you know, that ties in with the Azorius and their, you know, their obsessive need to, like, follow the law or, like, create the laws and things like that. Like, there's a lot going on here. And you have, like, almost the, is it like a portrait in the back there? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a yeah. whole host of sort of like the the halls that Azorius uses and whatnot to pass yeah. the laws that we from the Senate. Yeah, this stuff. is one of those arts I feel like I, you know, I mentioned in Is It Boilerworks. See, this is another one I can almost hear the sound of. Like I can almost oh. imagine like you walk through here and you just yep. hear the echo of like your heels on like okay. that floor on and marble. Just, yeah. yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Very nice. Absolutely. All right, let's move here to number three. Ruben, what's number three? My number three got an update in its art uh, in tenth edition, which I'm okay with. The new art was fine, but the original art that John Avon did for Apocalypse, Mm. I feel like told a story that was unique in in any piece of art I've ever seen, Um, because it's showing you the effect of what it can do, but it's not being overt in it. It's showing you the landscape, it's showing you the prism, it's showing you the the night sky, but it's not being, it's not shoving it in your face. It's terrifying in what it can do, but it's beautiful in how it does it. Uh, it's Legacy Weapon uh, at yes. my number three. 
Legacy Weapon is a seven mana legendary artifact originally from Apocalypse. Pay Wooberg, white, blue, black, red, green, colon, exile target permanent. Mm -hmm. It also has, if Legacy Weapon would be put into a graveyard from anywhere, reveal Legacy Weapon and shuffle it into its owner's library instead. The Legacy Weapon, of course, is a important part of magic's history uh with uh it's a combination of more than a dozen artifacts of various kinds uh the various gems of ramos urza's head the juju <laughs> bauble karn is part of the legacy weapon Karn himself um, and yeah com- coming all together to be able to save dominaria there's that the moon uh, i'm trying to remember this the moon is like full of mana or something and it's essentially like, essentially and that's like shooting through it and you see that the prism that it essentially makes um this card is absolutely fantastic and uh, it was very close to my list i really like this card a lot uh and sort of how it looks like Aaron, what's number three my number three is another threshold land. Uh, this is a land that I used to run in Vintage because you needed a land to pay for your ingot chewers back when we ran ingot chewers and also as a way to deal with containment priest or, you know, a Gixla jailer or something else that was annoying or maybe even a death rape shaman that was trying to ruin your day. We don't really run it so much anymore, but I have a lot of fond memories of this card. Um, my number three is Barbarian Ring. Mm-hmm. Um, so Barbarian Ring was also printed in Odyssey. It was a land. You tap it to add one red mana to your mana pool and Barbarian Ring does one damage to you. If you have Threshold, you can tap one red and then tap this, and you can sacrifice Barbarian Ring, and Barbarian Ring deals two damage to a creature or player. So, you know, it helps you pay for your Inger Chewers, it can kill a creature, sometimes it just gets in for burn damage, I have killed people with a Barbarian Ring before, um, and it just feels good, you know, I used to never leave the house without them, and, um, you know, really beautiful, kind of simple art, um, you get the feel of, this is one of those you can, you can feel looking at, like you can imagine what the stone feels like under your feet, and, you know, you have the torches there, you're in sort of like a desert at night it's really beautiful yeah this is and a part of red it, green beats and red deck wins for years and yep. years it, and goblins because you need it a way to kill creatures with protection from red mm-hmm. <laughs> because this is a land so it's a colorless source of oh, damage yeah. so it's you're able to kill your Ariok champions and your paladins and vec and various things like that and it was even used in the lands decks in legacy sure. as a way to just kill things or kill annoying creatures or yeah. you know, try to get rid, get of, rid of containment priest mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, it's like the OG Ramanov ruins <laughs> yeah <laughs> Very nice. And that card was banned. Well, um, I mean, it was. It was. <laughs> Here we go. All right. So uh, it's always interesting when you take a piece of artwork that has an original version that was already like super dope slash iconic slash really cool. Like there wasn't like anything we were upset about in the original piece of art. But when John comes back around and sort of does his own take on it and it is so cool and interesting and unique and i was like wow like even from this entire set even though the set was kind of total trash i really loved this card the artwork on ancestral vision from iconic masters is just incredible uh this was a rare from the set it is a sorcery that is blue it doesn't have a mana cost because you suspend it for uh suspend four for a blue so rather than exile or cast this card from your hand you pay a blue and exile it with four time counters on it at the beginning of your upkeep you remove a time counter when the last one's removed cast it without paying its mana cost and target player draws three cards is what it does so there was already a version in time spiral by mark pool who had done yeah. the original ancestral recall so it's not like we were pissed off or anything in this version right. no. but man that little sort of window into the world yeah, just incredible. Yeah, and it makes you wonder, you know, when I'm looking at this, you know, I wonder if that thing is even really there. Like, is it a magnifying glass where it's magnifying something that's already there? Mm. Or is it the kind of thing where, like, if you were to pull that 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 pain back, mm. that thing wouldn't be there? Like, mm. um, and I'm just trying to look around and I, I just notice the... You know, the spectrum of going from really bright, you know, you see the sunlight in the corner, the really bright pale blue sky, and then it getting kind of darker and darker and then dark green and the grass and like, it, yeah, it's, it's an interesting perspective. Yeah, super duper cool. Um, all right, let's move on here to our number two. Ruben, what's number two? My number two is a card that I knew I needed to have near the top of my list and I knew no one else would have on their lists. It's a card that is in my favorite set, Urza's Legacy. It is a card that features a color, pink, that I see almost never in Magic Card art. It's true, it's true. It features shapes, spheres, that are very difficult to do well and almost never done. And John Avon is able to put it all together in Aura Flux. And mm. it's just so gorgeous. I, I mean, I remember looking through my binder of... Urza's legacy 
when I had like the first set I ever collected every card of was Urza's Legacy. And I remember when I was flipping through, I'd always stop at Auraflux because it's such a gorgeous card. I never played this card, mm. but it's so, so gorgeous that I just had to have it on my list. Auraflux is two colorless and a blue for an enchantment. Other enchantments have, quote, at the beginning of your upkeep, sacrifice this enchantment unless you pay two mana. Yeah, and this was a common in the set from uh, Ursus Legacy, but from Ursus Legacy, but that's okay. I mean, the it's gorgeous. I mean, there's no doubt about it. It's almost a five dollar foil for a reason. Oh my gosh, this thing just can pop. I can only imagine. Uh, wow. I haven't seen it throughout the years. Yeah, it is a really cool card uh, from back in the day. Uh, Aaron, what's your number two? My number two is also a land, uh, and John Avon, you know, has done a lot of lands, so, you know, and he's very good at it, so, um, but, you know, I can't, I would, I would be remiss if I didn't include this card. This is a card I have played with in Modern, I have played with it in Vintage, I have brought so many blood gas back with this card, uh, and I've even used it to cast things like Gurmog Angler. Uh, my number two is Dakmore Salvage. Uh, yeah. So Dakmore Salvage was originally printed in Future Sight, you can, comes into play tapped, uh, you can tap it to add a black mana to your mana pool, and it has Dredge too. And so just good, fair magic. <laughs> um, because if you're playing any sort of dredge deck, you know, odds are you're going to mill a couple lands. And so, you know, sometimes you find yourself in a bit of a bind. You need to get your blood gas back right away and you can just dredge too. And so this is something you tend to save for later in the game when you've milled yourself quite a bit. You don't want to deck yourself, um, but you do want to bring everything back. It also lets you cast your sideboard cards. Um, you know, it, it's, it's just a, it's just a fun card. I have so many fond memories of, and, and the art's really great too. You know, you have almost like this beacon in the middle of a swamp, um, and this weird kind of collapsing, you know, tower building there, really beautiful sun in the background as well to kind of offset everything, kind of a purple haze, um, gorgeous card. Yeah, it's also another one of those that if you kind of look through the future side to the dual deck, to the modern masters, the ultimate masters, it does seem to get a lot brighter. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's some more sort of almost accents along the towers there. Uh, yeah. Which look really sweet. So. Lights almost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, my number two is uh, is one of my favorite cards, uh, just sort of period anyway, from Magic, because it's a great card. Um, but this particular version uh, was something that uh, when I was at Star City Games, I had spent time working with various artists to sell posters of their artwork. Um, we called them lithographs because that's a Oh, like these? Yeah. Yeah, like those. Okay. Those are really fancy words for posters, <laughs> and it's fine. But uh, one of the things that we did for John Avon, not only were those lands involved, but he also did a Return to Ravnica promo version of Supreme Verdict. Yeah. And it is nice. It is a nice one. And let me tell you, that poster was just absolutely gorgeous. It was it really fantastic. was. Yeah, it was great. So Supreme Verdict is a blue, uh, two white, and a generic mana for a rare sorcery from Return Ravnica. It says it can't be countered and destroy all creatures. That's what it does. But this kind of fortress, like, falling down with a shockwave, blowing the buildings from Ravnica apart, like, it, just fantastic. Iconic is ridiculous. So this was my number five, and it's interesting nice. because the original Supreme Verdict it appears to be going from top down, so mm -hmm. whatever is destroying everything, you know, it's more of a cyclone starting from the top, and John Avon's version almost appears like it's happening on the bottom, and so I really appreciate right. the parallels there. Um, the original also has a bit more brightness to it, and this one's also more dark, a lot more blues, very few oranges or yellows, and so just a really nice contrast to one another. Yeah, like yeah. kind of purple looking, you know. Mm -hmm. And when you get the big version, because I remember seeing the big version. There's so many little details yeah. in this art of people and bits of shrapnel. And it, there's, it's just so good. Yeah, it is fantastic. So I uh, always love that piece and uh, great to see it again. Okay, let's move on here to our number one. Goodness gracious, Aaron, what's number one? Well, speaking of bottoms... <laughs> Sometimes when we do these top 10 lists, you know, I find cards where I just ask myself, like, what were they thinking when they made this? How did this card get made? And usually it happens because a card is so powerful or it's so absurd. But um, sometimes you just kind of look at the arch and you look at the name and you're like, how, who greenlit this? I don't understand. Um, this card could never get made today. This was a different time in Magic's history. And I'm so yeah. glad that it exists. My number one is City of Aeos. <laughs> Yep. God, I'm so glad. On brand. I'm so happy. It's a Twenty-five dollar card, seriously. Twenty-five. So, City sure. of Ass is a land that was printed in Unhinged. Um, City of Ass comes into play tapped, and you can tap it to add one and a half mana of any one color to your mana pool. The flavor text says, "Bud." 
<laughs> and if you look at the text box, you see I, like a bit of a crack. I did not even notice that till now. I've I've seen this and card so many you times. Look at the art, and it's obviously a take on City of Brass, and there's just giant asses. <laughs> There's a, a bunch of butts. There's butts on top of all happen? the towers. Oh and, my god! Oh my I wonder god. how many of these he's like signed. <laughs> Will you sign my city of ass, sir? <laughs> this was my number nine. It's just it's one of those oh things. Oh my god! I know it's it's one of those things where like this is a incredible piece of magic art. I mean, it's silly. <laughs> it's over the top. Someone with a straight face had to go up to John Avon and say, yeah. "John, listen, John, I need you to paint a city of ass." <laughs> And I want asses everywhere. And we're going to yeah. put them in the text box. So you got to yeah. give us that crack. That crack right oh there, he drew that crack. God. That crack was painted by a man. Yeah. <laughs> also, all the people on the road leading into the city are all donkey They're people. They're all donkeys. That's right. They were donkey oh, people. Wow. The city of ass. Yeah, the, the, the one half mana thing was huge Ooh. and unhinged. Yep. That was a gigantic pull for it. So they went on and on about it, and it was incredible. Ruben, uh, what's your number one? I'm sorry. How you I top just, that, buddy? <laughs> I'm apoplectic. Well, the way that you top that is that you set a record. Mm. Because oh. on July 7th, 2019, uh, John Avon set a world record for the most expensive piece of art ever sold from a Magic the Gathering set. $40,000. Oh, and by the way, a sketch of the same art, not even appearing on a card, sold for $1,500. A sketch. Goodness. Um, John Avon most recently has been working digitally, but went back to airbrushing to be able to do this piece, and I'm so glad that he did. 8.3 inches by 11.4 inches uh, for Lotus Field. Mm -hmm. Lotus Field is a land from M20. It has hexproof. Lotus Field enters the battlefield tapped. When Lotus Field enters the battlefield, sacrifice two lands, tap, add three mana of any one color. Yeah. Very similar to Lotus Veil, which uh, John Avon also did, uh, but that was in Tempest 20 years ago. And now Lotus Field sees play in like the Twiddle Field decks, uh, the Underworld Breach decks. Yeah, Pioneer. Um, um, yeah. Pioneer has been, this is my number uh, eight. Pioneer has been defined by Lotus Combo almost since the format was created. Lotus Combo just won the Pioneer Challenge the other day in the hands of Connor Mullally. Um, a couple of the vintage people I know uh, from the Vintage Discord were playing this in the showcase. And, you know, you basically play this and then you play things like Hidden Strings. <laughs> To be able to untap them and you make a whole bunch of mana and then you can, yeah. you know, cast Ugins or you can, um, you know, you can play peer through de- the peer through um, peer into the abyss. You can peer also do oh, that. Sure. Um, and you can draw half ha- your library. Exactly. Love it. Or aim it at the opponent. You can have some really dumb turns with this, but it really revolves around this card and all of the ways that you can just break this card in half. Yeah, this is also one of those cards that, you know, I I like because in older formats, when you get all the silly, crazy cards, it does dumb things. Mm-hmm. It was fine and standard. Like, it was yeah. fine. Standard. It was fine. Yeah. Like, it was I used mean, a we had Field of the Dead to worry about. We had bigger fish to fry. Right. <laughs> yeah, we had way I mean, bigger I, there was like a Kiora Lotus deck for like half a second, but mm-hmm. it didn't do anything. This right. was card was completely fine, mm-hmm. but it is gorgeous. It is, And it is John Avon. Doing a Lotus. Mm-hmm. What else do you need? I mean, yeah. it's fantastic. And it also helps me segue into my number one. Because if you're going to sit around and talk about Lotus Field, let me tell y'all something. I want you, bro, I want to bring you back. I want to Uh-oh. bring you back to the game store back in the day when we're playing with Mirage and we're hearing after visions comes Weatherlight. And like Weatherlight's got some weird stuff in it, right? And that's that's really cool. You have to understand that at the time there was no other, and I've been looking for this. I'm pretty sure this is correct. At the time of Weatherlight's release, no other card had the word Lotus on it that wasn't Black Lotus. Right. And so when we saw Lotus Veil. We flipped the poop. It was <laughs> unbelievable. This card was like, oh my God, it's like a whole bunch of black lotuses. We were flipping out. Look, Lotus Vale is a rare land from Weatherlight. Wow. It is on the reserved list. So enjoy that. If it would enter, they had to, re- they had to reword this thing because people broke it in half. If it would enter the battlefield, sacrifice two untapped lands instead. 
If you do, put it onto the battlefield, and if you don't, you put it into its owner's graveyard, and you may tap to add three mana of any one color. So oh. you can see sort of what it was doing was you get to kind of have a, a Black Lotus you get to use over and over, but you have to get rid of two untapped lands at the same time. Of course, people would play it and put it on the stack because there were the new stack rules, and right. all sorts of things broke in half. But no, they fixed it, and Lotus Veil is great, and this card is just... It's on the reserve list, so we only get yeah. one of it, and that's it. And and it's the reason why we have Lotus Bloom from yeah. John Avon, is uh -huh. it's a callback to this card. It looks almost artificial. Like, when you look at yeah. it, you know, it looks plastic, or it looks like something yeah. out of, like, a, a digital computer game, or, like, it Too just doesn't perfect. look real. It doesn't look painted. I mean, it's not a bad thing, but, like, you know, everything yeah. we've seen so far looks very much like it could have been painted, and this, this looks very artificial. And like, this was very obviously painted with his hand. This was not digital in yeah. any way, because no. this is... Weatherlight. Yeah, this is 97, um, y'all. Oh, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> like, you know, they 3D modeling back then. invented it yet. Uh, also, shout out to Scorched Ruins, uh, another of the Sacrifice Two Lands Club that mm. John Avon did, which is also the art that is inside of the uh, snow globe in Annex. Oh, okay. So Ooh. that is a rough card to get annexed, is, is Scorched Ruins. That's true. Um, but yeah, that one's also, you know, a $32 card. Um, and, and I mean, John Avon, just the master of, of lands. I mean, you connect the Lotus now, you collect, connect the Lotus then, everyone loves Lotus, Avon gets attached his name to it, and it's fantastic. All right, that was our top 10 John Avon cards. You'll see them on the screen right now for your review. Take a look at my list, Aaron's list, Ruben's top 10, and we want to hear from you about what card we did not talk about, and we'll select our favorite to win a $50 gift certificate to CoolStuffInc.com. But before we go, I want to thank my co-host. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Ruben. This was a landmark show for us, <laughs> doing something brand new. We did do something brand new. As we move on here to our final slide, I want to thank our sponsor, CoolStuffInc.com, our co-sponsor, CardHoarder.com, my co-host, Aaron Campbell, and Ruben Bressler. You guys for watching or listening. I hope you support us at Patreon.com slash Magic Mics. Follow, like, tweet, favorite, share, subscribe to everything social that tells people we exist. Catch us online at Twitch.tv at Magic Mics, on Twitter at Magic Mics Cast, our Magic Mics subreddit, and like the Magic Mics page on Facebook. Talk to us privately at Magic Mics Podcast at gmail.com. Follow the audio only podcast at magicmikespodcast.libsyn.com or find us on iTunes and Spotify or join us here next week same time same place for another episode of Magic Mikes good night everybody <laughs>